Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and today I got something else from FedEx. As you can see I've already opened it. Um, I bought several interesting things on eBay recently and here's one of them. Is this radioactive? Let's find out. Seems radioactive. But let's see what it is. Camera lens. Now, why would a camera lens be radioactive? Well, if you know anything about the um, usage of uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials inside of consumer products, then you would know that camera lenses are one of the many things that have had their fair share of radioactivity. This is a Takumar made in Japan by the Asai, uh, As Asahai, Asahai, I guess, um, Asahai, I don't know, uh, Pentax um, company. I think Asahai is the actual company that makes them. There's three different brands on there, so you know what, I'm not a historian. Actually, my father's a historian, but I'm not, so you know what, whatever. These things are usually made around the 60s or so. I'm not sure what the actual data is in this guy. I mean, literally, I just pulled it out of the box like two seconds before I started the camera. So, like, I kind of really don't know. If you know anything about these, uh, feel free to drop me some information and let me know. Anyway, this is a basic um, camera lens. It looks like, I think, a 50 millimeter. Is it? Yep, it's 50 millimeter. A uh, pretty good lens, actually. When it comes to um, quality, this is a really good lens. There's the serial number, 6947423. Not bad. Take that off the back. And it's a beautiful lens. I used to be a photographer, so let me, listen, so let me just tell you that this is a pretty nice little lens. Uh, the yellowing in the back is the problem, though. You probably can't see the yellowing from the video. But that yellowing is the reason that this thing's radioactive. So let's just see how radioactive it is. First, we will test the front. All right, so we've set up the Geiger counter. We're getting somewhere in the 40s to 50 count per minute range. Let's take the um, detector. I mean, take the detector here, and we're going to open up the back where the actual Geiger Mueller tube is. This is going to get alpha, beta, and gamma, and of course X-ray too. So let's put this right here. Put this up against it so that it touches, well, close to touch without completely touching. And let's give it a second and see where it does. Let me pause the video. All right, as you can see, we're around the high 700 count per minute range. Well, actually, we just hit 800. This is from the front. So let's turn this over and see what we get from the back. Whoa, Nelly. Let's use the cap to kind of prop that up. That seems a little higher. Turn the light on. 24,720 counts per minute, 25,140. So let's say 22, 25, somewhere around 25,000 counts per minute. This is from the back, the part that faces you. When the shutter opens up in the camera for a brief moment, this is going to be pointing right at your eyeball, delivering that kind of uh, dose. Well, more actually at the lower part of your face. So let's uh, let's check out um, gamma and beta. Just gamma and beta alone, the stuff that's really penetrating. Now, beta is not too penetrating, but it can be. Gamma certainly is. It's many thousands of counts per minute. Six thousand so far. Let's try this on the Ludlum and see what we get. This is a Ludlum survey meter. Let's kind of pull the top off of this and move it down where you can see it. The Ludlum is getting around three to 4,000 counts per minute right this moment. This is zero. This is in the times, ten, oh, times 100 modes. So this is zero, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. And from the back, we actually go overboard. Let's switch it all the way up to the times 1000 mode. This is a model 12, it can go to 1000. So now this is zero, 100,000 counts per minute, 200, 300, 400, 500, so up to a half a million counts per minute, right? This is a one inch sodium iodide thallium dope scintillation detector. We're getting 140, about 150,000 counts per minute from the back. We should get about the same from the front. 
You would think that the front wouldn't be blocking that many uh, gamma rays and x-rays, but apparently it is. Fits perfectly, by the way. Exactly perfect. We're getting way less. Let's flip this back down again. So now we're at 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 counts per minute. The front is getting around 20,000 counts per minute. The side is getting way more. The side's getting 30,000 counts per minute. Not bad. Putting the cap on the back of it, let's see if that makes a difference. It shouldn't. It's just a little thin piece of plastic. Gamma rays should go right through it. And they do. Switching it back to times 1,000. Let's see. Get about the same reading. So yeah, the plastic does basically nothing. And setting this back down to the times 10 scale, to look at our background, we're getting about two to 3,000 counts per minute. This is 0, 1,000, 2, 3, 4, 5,000 counts per minute. So let's take this camera lens and let's put it in front of the gamma spectrometer and see what is inside of it. What makes this radioactive? Alrighty. So there's our lens and we're going to do a little gamma spectrometry. We're going to identify what nucleides are in this thing. The uh, detector that I'm using has a separate voltage. That's the high voltage um, input and a signal output. They're separate but they're combined together into this single cable right here via the splitter device that I got from G Electronics. That goes into this, this B Research Gamma Spectacular. This is the 1100A model. They don't make this one anymore. They make um, some better ones, actually. But anyway, these guys are great because they're inexpensive and they do gamma spectrometry. I can use my more expensive multi-thousand dollar uh, UCS-30, but I've used it a bunch recently, so I want to play around with this guy again because I like both of them and they have different uses. This guy hooks up to USB in the computer. Currently, it's delivering 850 positive volts of power to the actual detector. And the return signal coming back is going to my computer. And as you can see, we have a gamma spectrum here that we've already formed. This is not the lens. This is my calibration spectrum. And if you look at the calibration spectrum, you can see um, 32 keV uh, photons from cesium-137. You can see the Compton, uh, the backscatter peak, the Compton and plateau, the Compton edge, the cesium-137, and then these two guys right here. This is their Compton uh, plateau peaks and, and backscatter. These two guys right here come from cobalt-60. I'm using these two radionuclides to calibrate. Once I'm done calibrating, we're going to test this bad boy. All right, so now we're going to stop the accumulation of the calibration data. And let's uh, mark off some regions of interest around known peaks. For example, uh, that right there is a 32 keV peak that comes from cesium-137. That right there, the blue one, is from the lead background, XRF, X-ray fluorescence, if you like. What I'm trying to sit on right at this moment is the cesium-137 primary photo peak. And then these two little guys over here are the uh, cobalt 60 primary photo peaks. So we get that one. Let's get the next one. So we hit the B button to start it and begin, and then the E button to end, and that creates them. All right. Now the next thing we need to do is assign energies. And looking at the very top of the screen, if I select one of these regions of interest, it will tell me the standard deviation. It will tell me the region, the, the the centroid to the region of interest, and all this sort of information. And pretty much that's what I'm typing in here. Where is the centroid? Where is the standard, uh, the standard, what is the standard deviation? What's the energy? I'm going to put all of these little guys together and I'm going to set this thing to an interpolate, uh, interpolative um, uh, calibration. I believe what that's going to do is it's going to use something like maybe the least squares method to actually calculate an equation that governs change in um, uh, energy with respect to channel. Uh, this can also fit as a slope, it can fit as a linear. 
uh, a calibration. But for my detector, I've discovered linear doesn't work very well. Inter interplated works well, but only when I put at least minimum of three um, points in. If you put in two points, you might as well just select uh, linear. And the reason I do this, of course, is because there is a change in the actual energy per channel. So it's not straight all the way down. It's not like a, um, each, each channel increases by X amount of energy. There's multiple changes in that. So I'll put the information in, and then when I'm done with that, I can switch this thing over to a logarithmic view, make sure I haven't missed them. But I'm pretty sure we are good to go. Okay, so we finished the calibration. Here's my uh, spectrometry room. As you can see, I've got all my goofy stuff, lead bricks sitting around, rubber gloves. The rubber gloves are for the lead, by the way. I mean, sometimes they're for the samples, depending on what it is. But for a sample like this camera lens, I can hold this without the gloves just fine. But when you have the um, uh, gloves, you can more easily hold the lead without causing a trouble. Look at that. That's kind of neat. Anyway, so let's, um, let's pull the... Um, lead off. I need to order more lead and I need to repaint this lead. The paint is useful because it keeps the um, lead kind of locked inside of the bar so that you don't end up getting it all over the place. Because actually, quite frankly, the lead is probably more dangerous to me than the radiation. Alright, inside of this copper, the entire inside of this is lined with copper. Um, I have a um, I have a cobalt 60 and I have a cesium-137 check source that I used for calibration. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put this down here and we're going to take this camera lens and kind of stick it inside. And let me just see one thing here. Let's see how high this is. Move these out here. We're just going to put the camera lens here. The camera lens needs to be elevated just a tiny little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a piece of plastic the lens up against it. That should work out nicely. Okay, good. Making a lot of noise, aren't I? Yeah. Put my aluminum in the front. Cuts down on some of the XRF just a little bit. Get that up right there. Come on. You don't want to put the you don't want to put the um, camera lens right on it. You want to put it close, but not right on it. Let me put this down for a second. There. I needed two hands. So you can see the camera is inside. It's kind of covered up. All right the lead in place and we are good and encased inside several inches of lead for doing our testing so let's go back and run this for a little while and see what's inside this camera lens A quick uh, view of the spectrum clearly shows what is in this glass that makes it radioactive, thorium-232. And you can see this because of its decay progeny. That's the uh, decay products that come over time in the long change. A decays to B, decays to C, and so on. Um, the only one that, that the only two that are, are that are in the spectrum that are not necessarily a part of the glass, I'm not sure if they are or not, is, uh, well, first, the, the potassium-40, that's in the middle of the spectrum, that's uh, listed as K-40 at 1,461 keV. That might be from my background. I'm not 100% sure about that. Potassium-40 could also be in the glass as well. It could be in both. Um, the other one is the X-ray fluorescence at 75 to 85 keV. That's in the very far, very highest peak and the very far left. Uh, that's actually kind of the result of all the radiation coming from the lens bouncing off of the lead and not getting stopped by all the copper. If I got rid of the copper, that peak would be tremendously more pronounced. The rest of it is straight up thorium-232 daughters. You have lead-212, you have actinium-228, you have uh, thallium-208, bismuth-212, all those guys all the way down there. Definite, uh, definite thorium-232 uh, decay progeny. So we can say that that's the reason that the, the lens is radioactive. And thorium dioxide was added constantly to glass back in the olden days, the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, the, the reason is it increases the uh, refractive index of the glass. It makes way better uh, lenses than non-thorated lenses. The problem is, is that there are potentially safety concerns and um, it also causes the lens to turn kind of yellow over time. 
and that doesn't really appeal to most people, as you can imagine. Now, I'm not sure how unsafe this lens is. I am not a health physicist, and I don't just mean a PhD health physicist. I mean, I don't even have an associate's degree in health physics. My 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 uh, graduate, oh, sorry, graduate, my undergraduate degree was in computers. So. I am unqualified to say whether this is safe or not safe. I will say that my lay opinion is that I don't see why this would be particularly unsafe unless you had it all the way up against your eye all of the time. I mean, you're just a professional photographer. This thing is always in front of your face. Maybe then. But other than that, I can't see any particular um, safety issue with having it around for casual use. But again, that's my lay opinion, so don't come back and yell at me and say, oh, you said. Yeah, I did, but I also said it was my lay opinion, so listen. Anyway, uh, I'll see you next week. Um, I'll be getting my uh, Oculus Rift 3D virtual reality headgear so I can make like it was the 90s. Because back in the 90s, I used to do VRML programming, and I used to do a lot of 3D modeling and stuff. And I hadn't done it in years. I want to get back into it and see what it's like. So I'll, I'll, sh I'll do a review of that. So I'll, I'll talk to you guys at that point. All right, this is Tom from anti-proton.com. Like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Bye-bye.